Welcome to our fourth in our series on the path to salvation. Today we're going to, our topic is the struggle with the passions. We began our series by talking about the aim of the Orthodox Christian life and how that was to become united with Christ. And then our second one, we talked about the necessity of faith. It all begins with faith and then the need for a deep faith, one that is based with an experience of Christ that gives us a surety that he is with us and he, what he promises will become true for us. And with that, then comes the fear of God where we understand the spiritual nature of things, the spiritual realm and what it's like that there will be a final judgment and that we will be called to make this choice between being with God or being separated with God. So this is that fear of God that gives us the zeal then to continue on this path to nurture this faith and deepen it even more greatly so that we'll make progress towards this unity with Christ. And that progress is the necessity now to face this question of passions, our desires that cloud our heart, that make us block us, separate from God, and cause our sinful activities that we have in our way of life in this world. So let's recall when, when we talked about the nature of our situation, that when we were created, we can see on the right there, there was a unity with God working through our soul, working through our body, and bringing out this uh, image of Christ in us, that we become Christ-like in nature. This is our aim. But on the left shows our reality since the fall of Adam and Eve, that we are separated from God that the body has become in charge, the brain is in charge, and the soul has been suppressed and separated from this connection with God. But we still have within us this image of God, and we also have our free will, so we can choose to make our life different. So our, what we're going to do then is whereby through grace, that through our faith is going to bring more grace, and our cooperation with this grace, we're going to move more and more towards this likeness of God, with our uh, purpose being to reach this potential that we have for salvation and theosis and life eternal in his kingdom. So, looking at our current situation, this fallen condition, we find that our concern is mostly about our bodily needs. And we live with this constant fear of death and we worry about being sick, becoming sick, and we also have this desire for being socially accepted, to being liked and loved by others around us. And all of our other self-centered thinking that exists in our current way of being. Our ego has become the center part. That's become really what we worship and protect. And the brain does helps us protect that. So this fallen condition that we find ourselves in is reinforced by the culture that we are in. All the activities that we engage in are all about seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. This is the nature of our world. Television, movies, video games, the internet surfing, all advertised. The advertisements that we have that we're bombarded with, thousands and thousands of them every day, are only stroking our desires that we have. Whether it be sex, whether it be our fears, whether it be about social acceptance, about achievement, you think about the ads and what they're playing to, what they're trying to draw, why they want you to take their product so that you will have better sex, you'll be more secure, you'll be better accepted because you're going to be more beautiful, whatever it may be. They're all geared to stroke our desires. So we can't rest in the comfort of the culture that we exist in. And we can't be relied together either by just purely relying on our faith. More is required. We need to fight. We need to struggle. So what we call spiritual warfare is absolutely necessary. So as Paul puts it, we need to put on the whole armor of God so that we may be able to stand against the wiles of these evil forces, the devil. Let's look at how Paul himself struggles. Paul is one of the greatest disciples, right, of Christ. But how did he struggle? He says, For I know that in me, that is my flesh, 
nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. I find then a law that evil is present within me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. So we can see the struggle that Paul himself faces throughout his life and he takes many actions to overcome these struggles that we have and that's what we're going to talk about. So the question is raised is, why is it so difficult to do what God commands? Why does even Paul struggle? Why are intentions so not so often not carried out? What is it that keeps us from just simply following what God directs us to do? Why is this so difficult? So let's explore the full nature of this task that we all face in coming close to God, to trying to become united, to become like Him, and to be one with Him in His kingdom. Well, if we start with how we see the world, it all comes through these senses, taste, smell, sound, touch, and sight. And these, through these senses, we put together through our brain everything that we see in the world or experience in the world. It's all created from those senses. That's what we take in. And the brain then is processing all of that information. And to do so, it has to make assumptions. It has patterns built into it that made, makes it possible for us to process all of this information instantaneously. So the brain is central to our experience of the world. And from the way the brain interprets what senses are coming into us leads to our emotions, our actions, as well as our bodily functions, our heartbeat, digestion, and breathing. And underlying the emotions that we experience and the actions we take are what we call the passions. So the mind also is operating as we can take this to a higher level with reason and will. And we begin to understand the greater aspect of our soul, which is now being controlled by these more basic assumptions that are in our brain. And the soul is what's connected with God through the Holy Spirit. And then we have what we call the heart, which is the center of our being, which is where we experience in God, where God resides within us. This we have to un uncover, in a sense, liberate from these assumptions that are operating in our brain that keep us attached to all the pleasures and activities of this world. So what is the brain? What does it do? Well, first of all, it's a physical part. It's a part of our body. It's made up of living cells. And it, it serves the function of integrating soul and body and the external world. It's how we experience this external world, as we just said. And it allows the body then to adapt and interact with its, with its environment. It takes the inputs from the senses, as we described, and creates an integrated world, this whole world. And it provides the means for regulation of all our bodily functions. But its focus is on the body and its needs and its desires, the passions. That's its focus. That's its purpose. We have to lift ourselves above it and train the brain to operate the way God wants us to be. So it's nothing more than a complex network of physical connections. We got 100 billion neurons, 100 trillion synapses. This is a neuron that's showed here, and the little uh, ends uh, at the ends of those uh, web-like things are called the synapses, and they are joined together in chemical means. So it's a, a variable. It can be different degrees of connection. So this brain is incredibly complex, but made up of these cells, living cells that have these multi, 
connections with different parts of other cells. And so it's a whole network of, of, uh, of knowledge, I guess you might say, is trapped in there. And responses, so that we've taken these incenses, it's going to make the right direction quickly to go throughout our entire body so we can act and respond to the stimulus from we get from the world. Very complex. So in the brain, as we see all Homer here, is our mental programming. Yeah, it may make us feel sleepy. It may want us want donuts or duff beer, as it says here, or more sex, or has all the do's and don'ts and so forth in it. So anyway, it's, there's programming, programming that's in this brain that we have. And this brain is etched in patterns of behavior that we also can call habits. So we're going to have to get at these habits. The devil knows where we're weak, and so that's where it tempts us, where we know the way he can keep leading us in ways that are not to our benefit to carry out God's will. What we need is a strong and healthy soul so we can do God's will. So we mentioned these passions. What are these passions? What are they? When sin is repeated often and lurks in our soul for a long time, that's what they are. They're like bad habits that we have. Routines that we automatically fall into. And this is a movement that takes place from within us. From within our basic makeup. The way our brain has been programmed and conditioned. As Jesus says, From within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, fornication, theft, murder, and so forth. This word passion is derived from the Greek word psako, basko, to suffer, which indicates an inner sickness. So you remember the parable of the sower? This is the icon that's shown here. Christ is throwing the seeds along the path. But in the poor parable, he says, As for what fell among the thorns, they are those who bear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. So what are these thorns? What is he talking about, the thorns? What did he meant, mean in this parable? These are what we call the passions. And here's how Jesus explains this. He says, Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word making it unfruitful. It's like we're covered up, we're constrained by this covering of these thorns or these passions. So, are these passions natural to us? What do you think? Of course they are. God gave us these for a good purpose. So they aren't forces that we must root out. They're just natural powers of the soul that are corrupted. We're using them in the wrong way. Instead of for God's will, we're using to satisfy our own self-interest. So we can think of ourselves as being sick <coughs> and needing healing. St. Gregory Palamas says that the passions are when the satisfaction of our desires are foreign to the demands of nature, to what God intended for us. So what are these demands of nature? What are the natural ways that passions are intent to help us? to live in this world. <clears throat> so one good example, the simplest example, probably is our desire for nourishment. So we have this to live. We need to be properly nourished. So we have a desire to, to get the proper nourishment. But when does this desire become distorted? What takes place? It's when we use it for our pleasure, for just our sense of taste, to get a satisfaction from from it only, not for making our body healthy. So what are some examples of this? The kind of food that we might have at a fast food restaurant that makes it really tasty but not very healthy? 
you probably have your own kinds of foods that you know are not good for you, but you desire them and you want them continuously. And the advertisement is going to take you more and more to get that kind of food or that kind of drink. So what's the kind of nature that we get from seeking this pleasure from the food that we eat? What are the implications of these eating habits? Does it mean no more Starbucks? What is this all about? This pleasure, though, is what? If we get it, then what happens? It tastes good at the moment, but afterwards our stomach may not feel so good, right? Or our body may become ill and so forth. So, it's passionate. These things become passionate when it's something we must have. While we are not willing to support the church, we're spending our money on Starbucks, very expensive coffee and drink, right? Well, we don't have enough to support the church or not willing to support the church or those in need. Or we're, it's making doing harm for our body. We're not supposed to have it and it's causing problems with diabetes, heart conditions, clogged artery, arteries, and so forth in our body. This is when it's passionate. So the issue is about our attitude towards food. Are we eating it to make our body healthy? Or are we just eating it for our pleasure and satisfaction? So the natural desire is for our nourishment, focusing on this necessity to maintain the health and life of the body. But when it becomes sinful, what is it? What makes it sinful? It's when we just seeking delight in this food, placing our desires for the pleasure from it, above any desire for God and others perfecting our body to be good shape so we can carry out God's will. Instead, we're just looking for this immediate pleasure that we get from the sensation of eating whatever food it may be that uh, triggers our, our desires. So why is this so? It changes our sense of taste and, and the nutritive function into the center of our being becomes what the desire takes over, becomes what we have to do to, to satisfy. It's what becomes, overtakes our, our whole way of being. We desire what's most pleasurable for us, rather than what's right for us and what God desires for us. So the food takes on a value itself. It takes almost like a worship due to God only. That So instead of God, we, we're worshiping this kind of food. We want more food and we forget about God. In fact, when we take lots of food as we overeat, we are separated from God. God is not in our mind. And certain kinds of foods can easily become idols. So, look at this piece of cake here. This chocolate cake, my favorite. How long does this pleasure last? Every birthday I get this cake. And I start with one good sized piece like this. But I don't stop there because it's so good. I want more. So I have another piece. And if no one's looking, I may even take another piece. But after all this pleasure from this wonderful cake, there could be negative effects. My stomach becomes very heavy and uncomfortable. I have a hard time sleeping that night and so on and so on because I overate a something that wasn't really good for me. Now one piece to celebrate, that would have been fine. If I can control the desire for that, that's okay. But this kind of pleasure that we seek, and especially if we have to have chocolate cake, we have to have more of it. Maybe not just in our birthdays, but we have to have it where we can find it. We seek the pleasure of the flesh, which has nothing to do with the true joy that we are truly seeking to be one with Christ with our aim to be united with Christ is where we have true joy. And with his faith, we're going to receive divine grace, which gives us the kind of joy that we're really seeking. So sometimes we're seeking these other kind of pleasures because we're lacking this true joy. So here's St. James, that these kind of desires he's telling us gives birth to sin. He says, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Temptations. 
then, when the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. In sin, excuse me, in sin, when it's full grown, it brings forth death. So these temptations, these passions, lead us down a path that has nothing to do with becoming united with God. In fact, leads us often to things that are moving away from God, separating ourselves from God. That's what sin is, being separated from God. So you might want to think about, what are some examples from your own lives where your desires lead you to sin? Maybe the simplest kind of sin. We'll get into the deeper aspects of it later on as we talk later on in the course because this aspect of sin is something we're constantly under, uncovering step by step as we go down the path towards purifying our heart. So we have this pleasure, like the chocolate cake is an example, simple example, but when we have this pleasure, when we pleasure goes away, are we cured of the passion? Do I no longer want that next piece? This is obviously not true, right? Because it doesn't lead us to take action to temper the pleasure, but just to the opposite. It wants, makes us to want more. We seek more pleasure. And then it's going to go away again. But then we're going to want more. We're going to want it to come back. We're going to see it again. We're going to be tempted again. And we'll, oh, it was so good last time. And then it goes away. We may have a bad feeling in our stomach again. In the process and following this pattern, we form habits. We get programs formed in our brain. We see chocolate cake as an example. We want more of it. So we try to make something that is impermanent permanent and to seek even more pleasure through things that may not be good for us. And this cycle will continue. And it may be something more serious, something like our sexual passions and desires that lead people into all kinds of deep troubles. Father Dimitru, a renowned Romanian theologian, he says, the pain which follows pleasure, instead of making him avoid pleasure as its source, pushes him anew into pleasure as if to get rid of it, tangling him even more in this visual chain. So we think by seeking more, we're going to take care of it. But we're getting this cycle where it gets deeper and more ingrained in our brain, more programmed. The program becomes stronger. Those connections, those synapses in our brain become stronger and stronger. So we know that all creation that God created is good, so there's nothing that's necessarily that he's created is bad for us, right? So when is our desire oriented to sensible things worthy? It's when our love for them is according to nature, when the way God intended for them. The cake has nutrients in it, so we take a little bit, also has good taste, and we take the nutrients that feed our body and make our body good. That's when it's oriented, when it's worthy. Okay? We have to remember that everything God created is good. Nothing is evil in itself. Cake is not evil. A beer is not evil. A drink is not evil. We contemplate the, should contemplate the purpose of everything he made and discern its intended purpose. Think about what God had in mind for everything that we have this desire for. What was his intended purpose? Here's a list of passions. I'm going to go into these in detail. You can study those on your own. But these are the principal ones, gluttony, lust, love for money, sorrow, anger, spiritual sloth or apathy, vainglory, pride. And the principal source is our self-centeredness, our egotistical love of ourselves. This is the root of all these passions. And eventually, as we go through, we'll get to that core and deal with it. But probably not right in the beginning. We may deal with something as simple as gluttony, as eating too much cake, as an example. So let's look at how habits work. There was a, there's a good book. You may want to look at it if this thing of habits uh, triggers your interest. 
Charles Duhigg identifies a three-step loop about habits. Explain how they, the, they work in the brain. He talks about that it begins with a cue or trigger. And this cue or trigger tells the brain to go into some automatic mode. It seats a program that already exists there. So it chooses the habit and then there is a routine that is carried out. Some physical routine is triggered that we go into. And then as we enter that routine, there's a, a reward, right? That the feeds feedback to the brain said, this was good. I need to do this over and over again. Make that link stronger. Make that connection stronger between that cue and that routine because I'm going to get this reward. Here's how St. Maximus puts it. A really renowned uh, theologian, mystic of the church, early church. He says that memory brings a passion, free thought into the noose. Without passion, in other words. So it doesn't have a passion, so it comes in. This becomes the cue. So when this thought lingers, a passion can be set in motion. And then we're going to link it with desired outcomes. It's the desire and rewards, right? That we're talking about in the theory of habits. And then next there's an ascent, which leads to our actual action, the, the action that takes the routine that now is playing out. And this is the basic way that the church fathers see about it. So it's the same thing. They're talking about the same thing as these modern day gurus of, uh, in the self-help world. But once the habit is established, the brain, in essence, stops participating in decision-making. They're automatic. It's freed now, so we can deal with all these other inputs that are coming into it as we're walking down the street or walking through the house or walking into the church, whatever. It's all this input that's coming in. So those cues are going to trigger something automatically. We're not even thinking about it. The brain is no longer operating. Implications of this? It's like we're not in control, right? It's like some things are automatically happening. As Paul said, why, why do I do what I do not want to do? Why do I do it? So many of our habits are lead us in this repeated sinful actions. <coughs> so are we connected with God when acting out of habit? This thing's acting uh, automatically, and we're not choosing. Are we? How do we know we're acting according with God? I guess we need God habits, don't we? Unless we deliberately fight a bad habit and find new routines, this pattern of behavior is going to continue automatically. We have to struggle. We have to fight. We have to make change in our mind. We have to change our mind. Matanya, we talk about repentance. That's what repentance is all about. So we got to remember, these habits are hardwired into our brain. They're encoded in its structure. Through all these connections, through these millions, excuse me, millions and millions of cells. But this brain is physical. It's not moral. This is a physical part of our body. It can't tell the difference between good and a bad habit. So to change the habit from bad to good, we must work to change the very structure of our brain, the way we think, the way we act, and seek help from the soul. And this is where we need the help of divine grace. This is where the church and the Holy Spirit can help us. The role of the sacraments, the ascetic efforts prescribed by the church, our spiritual fellowship, our spiritual guidance, and so forth. These are all aspects of the things that Christ has given us through the church to deal with this basic problem that we face as human beings. Thinking about the cues for a moment here, researchers have found that to change, it requires that we change the cue. If they change in the slightest, our habits fall apart. So what we look at what's triggering it, what that thought is, and we reject it right at the beginning, right? We also call this watchfulness. So what are these cues? What are they? 
They can be a visual trigger like the chocolate cake we talked about. They can be a commercial on TV. They can be a good-looking person, a boy or a girl, man or woman. It could be some kind of verbal insight. Someone says something, it triggers a reaction to us. Anger. It could be an odor. It could be someone just touching us. It could be a certain place. It could be a specific time of day. It could be a sequence of thoughts. <clears throat> or the company of certain people. Can you think of some cues that trigger you into automatic behaviors that you don't particularly care that, that you act that way? Think about it. What are the cues that are working in your brain causing automatic routines to be triggered? Okay, let's look at these routines. These are the actions that result from receiving a cue or a thought. They can be complex or simple. It can happen in milliseconds. And the research is also once it happens, our whole body can change. The whole nature of our body can change before we can, so an anger can go through our body and we're doing things and our whole condition has changed. We can't stop it like a barking dog. So we have to get up front, right? We have to deal with the cues to change this, don't we? And we have to learn new routines. Sometimes we can come up with a different way when this routine comes up we know to act differently like not say anything could be a routine versus automatically saying da, 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 da. or walking away there's all kinds of routines depending on the nature of the cue right how about the rewards what are they these can be physical sensations that seem something pleasurable, like what we get from food, taste, the full stomach, drug, could be from drugs, sense of relief, relaxation, visions, right? Drugs are a big thing today. It could be emotional payoffs, such a feeling of pride that comes with praise or accomplishment. I do this, I get rewarded with people saying how great I am. So these cues and rewards work based on our cravings which is what our church fathers call passions. So the struggle is against the passions to purify our hearts so we can constantly be focused on God, constantly seeking to doing only His will and not just these automatic habits being triggered that take us away from doing what He intended for us. Alcoholics, from this is AA programs, particularly the information comes from, who believed in God entered their lives, believed, who believed that God entered their lives were more likely to make it through successful, stressful periods with sobriety intact. In other words, God helped them. Divine grace helps us. Our prayers help us overcome our bad habits. And the important thing is we've got to believe that we can change these habits. We can change the structure of our mind. And researchers have proven to us this is possible. This is not something that's impossible, even though it may be extremely difficult. And it's much easier when we have some kind of supportive community that supports us in our struggle. So for spiritual growth, this is a purpose of a faith group, a uh, faith group community, like a parish, like a Bible study group, like the classes like we're engaged in now. These are all good ways to make a supportive community to help us in our struggles, to keep us reminded of the path we're on and the difficulties that are normal and to get the courage and support. So remember, 47% of our choices are based on habit. That's a lot, right? Remember how Paul says that he does not intend why he does what he does and should not do. He doesn't understand what's going on, he says. Because he's doing what he does not want to do, even though he knows he should be doing something different. And we all always have the power to choose good. But, just like Paul, there may be habits that override these intentions to do good. And these we need to overcome. And remember, they've been hardwired in our brain physically. So it's a lot of effort to undo that condition in our brain. 
So remember, being a Christian is not easy. It's not something go on automatic pilot. It's something we have to work at with a lot of effort on our own part. We must struggle. We have to struggle with the passions. And we also, though, have to work in cooperation with grace because this is the only way it's going to happen. It's so difficult that simply with just our own struggle, it's almost going to be impossible. But at the same time, with prayer and seeking grace in our faith, we're going to get strength from within to also work on this and make these changes. So there's some deep questions we can should ask ourselves as we're thinking about these automatic habits, 40% of our actions being controlled by this automatic activity. What is life all about anyway? What is the aim of our life? Isn't it to become one with Christ, to become united with him, to become like him, to love our enemies like we love ourselves? Isn't this the kind of thing that we have to, our life is about? This The life is the way we work all these things out, right? So we're prepared to enter his kingdom. So we can't lack this aim of our life. If we're lacking it, if we have only an intellectual faith and no clear vision of the spiritual realm, we're going to lack the zeal. In other words, to make these God-pleasing changes in our, in our lives because it required energy, motivation to do it. But with true faith, we have hope for eternal life in heaven. And this motivates us to, must, to learn then that we have to rid ourselves of these bad habits. So we will have, in reality, this hope of eternal life. What's been promised to us if we follow Christ. So with true faith comes grace. So we can follow a course that makes our hopes a reality. So, our first task is to make this hope real. That we have this personal experience with Jesus Christ. That our faith becomes something so deep that we receive His grace. We know His grace. We know Him. We know He lives within us. So we need to seek grace and the Holy Spirit to be working from within us. Of course, after we've been baptized, we have this opportunity. Once we at least come to that point of being baptized, now we're going to have the opportunity to constantly seek this grace and have it working from within us. And what we need is some God habits where everything that we do is to glorify God knowing that our reward from this new God habit is going to be our eternal life in heaven. So in the church, we have this incredible help of the Holy Spirit through the sacraments of the church. And we have a guide that's available to us through our spiritual father. He has no other purpose than to help us with this struggle. And the Spirit can be nurtured in us through the ascetic practices such as prayer and fasting. They are an optional, they are essential if we want to live an orthodox way of life and be a true Christian. So, we need to build good habits like regular participation in the sacramental life of the church, daily prayer and fasting. We have to have these good habits. Sometimes it takes changes in our structure, our life. It's not easy to make these changes. Remember that our salvation is not guaranteed, guaranteed just because we say we're Orthodox Christians and we've been baptized. No, we have to cooperate with God. We have to learn to be united with Him. Synergia, we call it. We want to become like Him. We want to seek union with Him. Theosis. This requires our cooperation with divine grace. Essential part of our development of being a true Christian. So, a good place to start is to evaluate our spiritual life. What are we doing? How do we pray? How do we worship? Are we participating regularly in the sacraments of the church? Do we continually seek to draw upon the powers of the Holy Spirit? As it says in the Psalms, 
you have said, Seek my face. My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek, inquire for, and require. So all these activities we've outlined here, these are the way that we seek by daily prayer and worship, by participating in the sacraments, by seeking and through our prayer to call upon the Holy Spirit to help us and work through us. In Proverbs, it says, Develop the habit of acknowledging God in all your ways, and then He will direct your steps. Remember, there's power in what God gives us through the Holy Spirit. Here we have Peter. He says, Gird the loins of your mind, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, but you also be holy in all your conduct. So he's trying to encourage us, right? He says, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Submit yourself to every ordinance. We're going to need a ton of self-control, right? Paul says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you? Unchastity, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. But now put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and foul talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. He says, put off this old nature with its practices, we could say its habits, and put on a new nature with its God habits, right? Which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, becoming like Christ. So isn't that the reality that most of us are really chasing after and pursuing the pleasures of this world? What are the consequences when we become corrupted by sinful habits through passions? What is our life like? We could probably look at our current, all the frustrations that we have currently. So our mind becomes scattered, seeking after all these different pleasures, wandering constantly, fleshly and earthly things, trying to seek pleasures that seem to be beyond our reach. It knows no peace. We don't feel peaceful. We seek peace, right? But it's not there. Even when prayer becomes difficult, our mind is filled with so much things, so many different thoughts. We can't even silence our mind. We, need to, we just have a lot to work to do, right? In such a state, the soul has lost control. And we can say it's become dead because it's overpowered by all these passions that we have clouding our heart, clouding our making choices that truly are in line with God's will for us. The body, its senses, and intellects are taking over, and they form this strong ego center that we have. So we become pleasure seekers for our own personal satisfaction instead of being God seekers. So how does this work again? What's the key here to understand? It's our habits, right? It's through habits this is taking place. These things are getting programmed in our brain through all these connections from these living cells. St. Theophon, the recluse, he calls it a self-pleasing life rather than a God-pleasing life. I think that's a great way to think of it, wanting to have a God-pleasing life rather than a self-pleasing life. So when one lives a life with the aim of pleasing God, he lives in a unity with God, and he's not distracted by these passions. The issue is a worldly mindset. Jesus said, If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, is not of the Father. St. James says, Friendship of the world is enmity to God. Whoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Think about that. And here we have another quote for St. Paul. He says, For many walk who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is going to transform our lowly body 
that it may be conformed to his glorious body. So we can't forget the spiritual aim that we have, the nature of the spiritual realm. But also knowing that we are like many who have set their minds on earthly things and maybe forgot that we are citizens of heaven and destined for eternally, eternal life in his kingdom. So instead of seeking pleasure from this world, we should long for the world above, the heavenly kingdom. Our desire needs to be directed to the kingdom God promises and to liberate our soul from the passions and its bad habits and all the excessive desires that we have and find and experience in this world. This is what the Orthodox way of life is all about. This is what we're going to be talking about from here on. This is what makes the Orthodox faith different from most other Christian faiths. We know that we have a lot of work to do on our passions, and we're going to now find ways to get help through the works of the church and its holiness to guide us and lead us and give us strength to make the changes in our life that are essential to be prepared to enter eternal life. So the church shows the way to deal with this difficult but most important challenge. We must realize that we cannot do it on our own effort, but only through the cooperation and the grace of the Holy Spirit, the synergia. And this effort that we're making is often called the purification of the heart. <clears throat> we're freeing up what's in us already that we received from our baptism. And we have to realize that it's a difficult path requiring persistence and endurance. We're going to need to have these support groups. We're going to need to have the advice and guidance of our spiritual father. In addition to our participating in our daily prayers and our fasting and the ongoing worship service and sacraments of the church. So it's a life of repentance that we're talking about. And the church provides us with many tools to aid us along this path prayer and fasting, repentance and holy confession, worship and holy communion, praying with icons, reading the Bible and the church fathers, ordering our life, and learning to put others first and giving alms to others. So this orthodox way of life begins with knowing our aim, our faith, and our awareness of the spiritual realm. And cultivating this desire we had to become like Christ, to be one with him, to love him totally above everything else. And so we're embracing his teachings as well as his church. His church is the body of Christ here on earth. It's him. We make up pieces of his body. We become like him so the church is like him. We become obedient to the direction of our spiritual father. He will help us. And the practices of the church, if we can surrender ourselves, know the church is going to guide us in the right way, we can follow the guidance that they give us. And we will grow in this direction. We will be, develop godly habits. So, surrender based on love and trust in Christ and trust in his church. And with this, maintain a continual attitude of repentance. Think of this continual attitude of improvement. So we have it kind of like this. We have the creation and there was a fall of mankind. So we had this fallen condition separated from God. And he showed us through the incarnate Christ who was sent to, to, to save us, to show us the path to salvation. And he shows us through not only his incarnation, but his resurrection, right? His suffering, death, and then resurrection, his victory over death. And somewhere along this path, we are awakened to this truth that God came and showed us this way. And we are baptized, and we receive the Holy Spirit within us, and Christ now lives within us. And so then, by participating through grace and our own will, this synergia, through the ascetic disciplines, prayer, fasting, study, meditation, repentance, and ongoing worship and Holy Communion. We're going to grow in that way. 
and we're going to move towards theosis and a more virtuous life and learn to love God and love our neighbors. This is what it's all about. And then finally we'll come to either a death and the final judgment where we'll be all, everything will be reconciled to God, right? And if we've been good and used our life as God intended it to, to purify our heart, to become closer to him, to constantly learn to improve ourselves, we will find paradise awaiting for us as our reward.